basement and we want to fund our schools, we're going to have to be willing to pay more money to do that because I don't see a magic solution in the state legislature that all of a sudden is going to create those additional dollars. And my concern is that if we don't value education in the same way as our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, that our children are not going to have those same opportunities. And if you go back to the number I gave you with LCFF, 57% of our children's families are, you know, they're, they're between, you know, we're at 185% of the poverty level below. They qualify for free and reduced lunch. We can't leave half our population behind and have a successful economy. So I think getting to adequacy is something that we, none of us are going to solve individually, but collectively we all have to work together to try and solve that issue because if not, it's going to impact our children and their future and, and impact all of the, the children in the state of California. So, um, so this thought just occurred to me, we probably have it for a larger discussion, but I'm wondering, you say, what is adequacy? Except we all know, we don't know what it is, but we know we're not there. But I'm wondering what the legislature passed the LCFF, and it said, here are eight priorities. And that includes uh, college and career readiness, some of which don't adopt involve dollars perhaps, school climate, maybe, maybe not. But uh, are those eight priorities, is that the definition of adequacy that the legislature considers in that every district now will struggle with, and some may come back and say, we can't reach these eight priorities because we don't have the resources for them. I'll give you a really simple answer. We all can come up with those goals just like we come up with mission statements for our school districts and schools and everything else. But the reality is, is there's not the political will right now to discuss, to, to define adequacy because no one wants to know what it costs. You know? When we brought this up with LCFF, we said, look, we ought to be talking not just about how we change the formula, but we ought to be talking about adequacy. You know what? If you know what it costs, then you have an obligation to do something about it. And so I think, you know, we need to start the conversation, but we need to do it not just in dollars terms, but in what our vision is for our schools, what kind of education we want our children to receive. Anyone else? Uh, okay. So back to the budget. Um, um, it's funny we talk about uh, um, such a shortage of resources. Probably the best year we're coming into in terms of an average double-digit increase, at least for the local control funding formula. It will vary, as we know, district to district. But um, uh, rarely, we, I, uh, I think school services says now in 20 years that we had a year where so much money will be coming to the school. So I'm wondering if looking to the budget, A, did we, do you like the proposals that the governor has? Are the priorities right? And then B, if there's more money, which many folks are saying that come May the, the revenues will be higher, what might be your priority then? And whoever. Well, for me, um, I think those cuts we made to the social safety net and Joan's comments, we we're all affected by this. You can't have an economy that's going to grow at three, five, six percent if a quarter of the, of the quarter of the people who live in California are trying to get by on twenty-five thousand dollars a year and for a family of four. So those social safety net cuts we had, we made, I think we have to. We were really thoughtful, I think, about how we cut those, and I don't think. We, members of the Democratic Party, had enough credit for our fiscal stewardship the last four years. These were really painful cuts, but when we made them, we knew that they weren't sustainable. So for me, I think we have to, we have to start reinvesting in that social safety net. But the struggle is, and I think when we talk about um, how we raise taxes, the Prop 25 allowed us to pass the budget with a simple majority. We still require a simple majority to raise revenue. Um, but all the polling I've seen is, you know, this recovery is largely an investment recovery. So we've all done better in our investments, whether it's real estate or uh, in the stock market. But it's not a wage recovery. So a lot of folks just don't have the disposable income. And this is, this is irrespective of what your party affiliation or your ideology is. People are not very supportive of being taxed more, even for education. They did that for Prop 30 largely because they wanted it to go to education. Um, so it's a real balancing act, and I think it's a struggle that the state's going to continue to go through and still be amazingly competitive in a, in a global economy. I think 
in terms of the budget this year, there's some critical elements. One is the issue of deferrals, which we talked a lot about um, in my subcommittee over the last three years, um, and that was, uh, you know, the, the idea of really late payments to schools and the, the impact that was having on schools, particularly some of our neediest schools that then had to go out and finance uh, the gap. They didn't get the cash from the state, so they had to go borrow. Uh, the governor's proposal is to pay those deferrals back, and I think that's um, something we've been, uh, we had a plan the year before, and it was going to take longer. With this extra money, the governor said, let's just do it. Let's, let's get back on track. Let's start making our payments on time. So you may not see that as a, as a debt, but it certainly was a delay in payment that, that caused a debt on, on many of our districts when they had to go finance. So the payment of deferrals is, I think, um, a very uh, strong element of his proposal. I, I think, again, you know, secondly, the one-time money that we're going to see, um, I would really encourage your advocacy strongly on releasing that one-time money into um, technology infrastructure, continued professional development, instructional materials, and um, the idea of really helping schools get a jump start all on their CTE, in addition to what's been done, but also link learning, STEM learning, um, that a lot of districts would be able to do quite a bit with just some seed in transitioning into a greater integration of their STEM um, ambitions. So I think that, that there's still a lot uh, of, of potential with the one-time funds. I think with the way the budget is currently structured, um, it's, it's very sound. Um, I think there's yeah. some other questions of yeah. new expenditures that you might want to talk I about. Will, we will get to that. Now, Joan, um, address the issue of more money for, for Common Core, if there's more money uh, or other things. I, I support the governor's budget. I mean, the only area where I have significant disagreement with him is using cap and trade money for high-speed rail. But, um, you know, we're closing, we're closing the gap in education by moving 28% closer to the targeted numbers. Um, I think the rainy day fund is long overdue, and, and it's structured exactly the way I would design it to structure your, our, our capital gains revenue is the most volatile. So we're saying, okay, let's take a look at our average capital gains revenue and anything above that, put it into a rainy day fund, but also create a separate pot for education so that, you know, we're able to use that to help stabilize revenue, because volatility when you're budgeting is all you know is not your friend. If, if the LAO's numbers are right and not the Department of Finance and we get more by Prop 98, more money is going to come into education. And I could definitely support putting that money into, um, into implementation of, of Common Core and helping districts buy the technology and, and gear up their bandwidth. Because we do have to remember that the sales tax revenue drops out at the end of 2016, that's about another $1 billion a year. And the Prop 30 money um, uh, is, dro drops after December 30th, 2018. And so as you're moving forward balancing your budgets, um, your problem is actually in some ways bigger than our problem because you need to spend that money in a way that when, if, if the taxes aren't renewed, you have to spend that money in a way that you don't find yourselves all of a sudden making uh, devastating cuts in, in 2019, 2020. You know, one of the um, reasons there's so much extra money for LCFF is that other areas have been flat, pretty much flat funding, and I know uh, Senator Social Services are, are great concern viewers and, and others as well. So if there's additional money, I mean, should it go to Social Services? additional money for Common Core, one time, or whatever, it, it, it may we find there several billion dollars. Well, it would depend if it was in Prop 98 or not. Yeah. So I'm talking about within 98, um, which is the K-12 and up through your community colleges. Um, and I don't think we should leave them out of the discussion because we all know how important it is for our young people not just graduate, but then be able to go on and actually get you know training in community college or four-year college as well. So I think it's outside in the general fund, there's gonna to continue to be great pressure. We have our UC system, wants more money than the governor's offering in the budget. Cal State wants more money. Then there's the, the issue of poverty and social services. You know, are we just robbing Peter to pay Paul when we don't address the needs of young poor children in terms of their nutrition and their health needs and their shelter? Then we wonder why it's gonna cost more in school to, to help them learn. You know, we have to see the whole child. 